Last week, it was Easter, so we took a little break from the narrative of John. Today we are back in John chapter 4, back to the woman at the well. It's a long passage, but today the woman is leaving. She's going to tell others about Christ. So Jesus is going to deal with the disciples, and finally the Samaritans will return at the end. Now I'd like to go ahead and show you a map it might be helpful for you. As I told you a few weeks ago, Jesus has come from Jerusalem in the south, and he's going to the north. He's going to Mount Gerizim. It's roughly 30 miles, so that gives you an idea. Now, what he could have done is he could have crossed the Jordan River. Go ahead and show them the next map there, if you have it. There you go. He could have crossed over the Jordan River and gone to, into Perea, in Gilead, and then worked his way back uh, to Galilee. He doesn't do that. Do you remember why? Because the Lord said, because Jesus said, I must, we must go here. This is God's will. And God's decreed sovereign will, he's supposed to go there and witness to this woman. We'll be talking a lot about the will of God today. Thanks for those maps. Appreciate it. Um, now, on to this woman. According to church tradition, the woman's name was Photoni which actually means enlightened. And now, it was given to her by the apostles at her baptism, but this is church tradition, so it's not in the Scriptures. We don't know that to be for certain. But uh, needless to say, according to also to church tradition, she was martyred for sharing the gospel later on. So she would finally get to fully imbibe those springs of living water that would come forth from her um, as the Spirit would so dictate now, Proverbs 11.30 is really not where we're going today, but it's the phrase that we're going to use today. Proverbs 11.30 is this, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who wins souls is wise. That's what we're talking about today, the wisdom of winning souls. Now, in our context of the New Testament church, we use that term to describe uh, witnessing, making disciples. Charles Spurgeon wrote a really good book on evangelism called The Soul Winner. And yet, really, when it was written in Proverbs 11.30, they wouldn't understand anything of the gospel, per se. But I like the way one of the, one of the interpreters, or rather commentators, mentions, to win souls is to capture people with influential ideas. It's to capture people with influential ideas, uh, it can be used in a good way to win souls or a bad way. Probably the most nefarious example uh, of one who wins souls, the one who actually steals hearts, is a guy named Absalom. He basically steals the kingdom away from his dad, and he, quote-unquote, wins souls to, his, to his, uh, uh, his side, but it's terror. It's horrible. It's a bad way to win people. There's also a good way. And what do you suppose the best way to win people? What is the most, oh, I don't know, the most um, influential idea that we have? I'm just going to take a stab at it and go with the gospel. Of course, of course it is. It's the most influential idea that we have that the Lord tells us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, you will be my witnesses. You will go out and make do we do that? <laughs> Some yes, no, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, according to God's decreed plan, it happens. And he uses his people. I've joked about this before, but I always kind of wanted to be more of an Old Testament people of God. The Old Testament people of God got to go into the land and kill Canaanites. You know, that seems... I was a troubled kid, I guess. Um, <laughs> But I was so terribly fearful of talking to people about the good news. Terribly fearful. And some of you know exactly what I'm speaking about now. And part of it was due to my lack of love. When you don't love people, you don't really care what happens in their future. Or maybe it was off of Romans 1.16, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to the salvation of everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek, Paul is making a stab right there and saying, I'm not ashamed of this. So maybe that's our issue. 
It's something. You can't just say, well, it's, it's nothing. No, it's something. Why don't we talk to people about the Lord? Why don't we seek to win souls? Sadly, we are too often ashamed of the gospel, not loving others, not loving the Lord. I'll tell you a story about that. Dr. Johnson, uh, an old professor at seminary, writes this. There was an old Presbyterian pastor evangelist by the name of George Mingans. He grew up in Philadelphia, and as a youth, he was an infidel, an unbeliever. He had many unbelieving companions. And sometime after his conversion, George was visiting one of his old companions and staying with him for a few days. The man said to him after a few days, George, I hear you're a Christian now. Is that so? It is, said Mr. Mingans. And George, do you believe in God? Oh, I do. And George, do you believe in hell and that all who do not believe in God and in Jesus Christ will ultimately go to hell? George responded, I do most solemnly. Well, George, said his friend, does Christianity dry up all the milk of humanity in one's body as it does in yours? (laughs) Why, said Mr. Mingans, what do you mean? And he said, I mean this then you've been living under my roof for three days and three nights, knowing and believing all of this that you've just told me, and yet you've never put your hand on my shoulder or said one word to save me. So lest we be too quick to condemn our friend George Mingans, perhaps that's you today and me today. I'd like to give you an outline for this. Uh, Thankful to Stephen Cole, who, who wrote parts of this outline. I've changed it a little bit. He's an old pastor of, in Arizona. John 4, 27 through 30, we see Christ uses the witness of those who are passionate for him and willing to go. Passionate for him and willing to go. In John 4, 31 through 38, we'll see Christ encourages his followers to embrace a harvest mindset. What's a harvest mindset? We'll be taking a look at that. And then finally, verses 39 through 42, Christ rewards those who actually go out to bring others to him. You see, it's one thing to be convicted. It's another thing to be passionate. It's a completely different thing to actually do it. So this is the word of the Lord. Verse 27 through 30, according to the outline, Christ uses the witness of those who are passionate for him and willing to go. Tommy Nelson, Denton Bible Church, used to always say, God doesn't drive parked cars. Um, Are you willing to go? And some of you go, I'm willing, I just don't want to. And that's probably the truth of it. You know what? We're supposed to ask and seek and knock. And so years ago, I began to ask the Lord, would you please give me a passion for talking to people about Jesus Christ? Because Lord, I don't want to. And I'm ashamed of the gospel and I don't love people enough to give them the gospel. That's just the truth of it. The Lord is, is fine with your rank on, honesty in these things. He already knows anyway, so you might as well admit to it and confess those sins to the Lord. And I began to pray about that, and I, I still pray about that. Um, but he does, and he can increase your desire. He can do it. He's the only one he, who can do it. So that's what we're gonna see today. Verse 27, just then his disciples came back, and isn't that God's perfect timing? They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Now, one of the translations puts it this way, they were shocked that he was talking with a woman, and that's actually a better rendition of it. Uh, Jewish rabbis, you see, don't talk to a woman on the street. Even in their wife, to their wife, they don't speak to her in public. Uh, or certainly not someone else's wife. Think of the gossip that would come from that. As a matter of fact, uh, the way to look at it like this, at best, talking to a woman is a waste of time. I'm not saying that. That's the first century, the social mores at that time. We're talking about Jewish rabbis in particular. The rabbis wouldn't do that, no. And that would be at best, but at worst, it's a diversion from the study of God's word. You should be in the word. So, and not only that, is this woman a Jew? No, she's a Samaritan, which makes it all the worse. But notice this, no one asked him any questions. And that's commendable on the part of his uh, disciples 
They're starting to figure out something about Jesus. His ways are not my ways. And I hope you and I are starting to get a glimpse of that in this life. I hope you're starting to really imbibe that because the longer you hold on to Jesus should be doing it this way. We're in for a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache. God's ways are not ours. Verse 28 through 30, let's find out what else happens. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, "Could come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now the woman left the water jar, and I think a lot of commentators have spent, spilt a lot of ink on this. Why is that there? Why does John include that? Is that important? So I'd like to give you three options. Sometimes we do this, oh, we do this a lot. Because um, really, there's, there's just differing views on this. It's interesting. Number one, she leaves her jar due to her excitement in telling others of the Messiah. Well, certainly she is excited, and you'll see this as we continue on. Could be. Number two, she leaves her jar so that Jesus could finally get a drink of water. Remember, he asked her that at the beginning, and there's no indication she ever gives him water. Maybe she's like, oh, I'll just leave it here for him. And I think perhaps it could be the third option would be this. Symbolically, symbolically, she won't need the jar anymore since she now has the waters of life. One of the commentators puts it this way. We don't really know the answer to that question, but we know this, that she came with a water pot and she left carrying the whole well. Well, she went into the town and she began to tell the people. That's the Greek word anthropoi. It can mean one of two things. She, anthropoi can many times just mean the men. And so she goes specifically to the community elders of the city and she tells them. Maybe that is the translation. I like the way most of your translations are. And that is she goes to tell the people. It could mean just generic. Whoever wants to hear she says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Now, if Jesus were to meet with each of us and tell us all that we ever did, that would be a really long conversation. No, I think she's using hyperbole. Uh, Jesus, in fact, has figured her out. Not figured, but he knows her. He's omniscient. And yet it's interesting to note the Jews believe that this is one of Messiah's abilities, and I think sometimes we have forgotten this was one of his abilities, that he could tell the secrets of people's hearts. Isaiah 11 predicts this, verse 2 and 3. The spirit of the Lord shall be upon him, meaning the Messiah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. What's it telling us? It's telling us Jesus didn't just go, hmm, let me study this situation first to figure out what's happening. Or let me, let me hear all the, all the information so I can make a decision. No, he's God. And they didn't, keep in mind, the Jews didn't think he would be God, but he thought, they thought the Messiah would some have, somehow have some sort of uncanny ability to read minds. And certainly, we have several examples of that in the Gospels. And so she says to them, can this be the Christ? Or maybe what a better way to write this would be, this can't be the Christ, can it? Uh, it's, the Greek supposes a negative answer, but you can tell the way she's doing this, perhaps some sort of reverse psychology. She wants this to be true. And it's clear that the people are gonna come check it out for themselves. So they went out of the town and were coming to him. Very important. The verb tense here. They keep coming. There's many the more she tells, the more they're starting to come towards Christ. So you would look and you would see all these people coming towards him. Don't forget that. We'll see the reasons for that in a moment. Verses 31 through 38. Uh, verse 31 through 33 for now. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? This is kind of a funny passage here. Uh, they're concerned about his lack of food. I think that's very kind on their part. There's another view could be this. They've brought their food and they're ready to eat with Jesus, but Jesus is not gonna eat anything. 
Perhaps he, he was supposed to lead in prayer, and they're like, here, eat, so we can eat. We don't really know. Uh, I think that they were probably just concerned about his lack of food, and so they kept saying to one another, who has brought him something to eat? I love the way the old Puritan John Trapp wrote in 1650 in his commentary. He said this, how dull and thick-brained are the best till God rend the veil and enlighten them. Yes, yes. Um, Because Jesus has just told them, I have food to eat that y'all don't know anything about. Now, of course, to be clear, of course he was hungry. But he wants them to know that spiritual food actually at times can give more vitality than the physical. Many of you have gone on mission trips with Mike. That's wonderful. Uh, And you've found yourself in that situation where perhaps you're going door-to-door witnessing. I myself have been there. And it's lunchtime, and I don't want to stop. It's not because I'm godly, because you all know I'm not. It's because I'm enjoying witnessing, and I'm like, really, it's lunch already? Let's just keep going. You know, why stop? And um, some of you go, I can't relate to that at all. But suffice it to say, many times the spiritual aspect is, it's like it fulfills. You you turn around, you go, I haven't even eaten today. I don't even care. And that's the Lord. That's nothing in you. That's the Lord doing that. And so this is certainly the first author of this is Jesus Christ. I have food you don't know anything about. And they go, who's fed him? Who's given him food? Uh, I really think Jesus is here echoing chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, verse 3, where it says, God humbled you, meaning the children of Israel, and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Let me tell you what, if you are more concerned about, I'm ready to go to lunch today, instead of the word, don't be that way. Pray the Lord would give you a hunger for his word. He can do that. So what does Jesus say? Verse 34 and 35, we'll see... Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, verses 31 through 38, what we're seeing is Christ, he's encouraging his followers to embrace a harvest mindset. What do I mean by a harvest mindset? Well, there's those who sow and those who reap One is not better than the other. They're on the same team. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But returning to verse 34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. You see, what do you mean by God's will in this particular case? I would take it not as God's decreed will, although it certainly is, but another aspect of his will, and that is what God is telling me what to do. And Jesus is saying, in essence, this, I have come to proclaim the kingdom to the Jews and even the Gentiles as well, and that food is most important, the spiritual aspect here. And I have come, he says, to accomplish his work. Now, if you will, erase Christ from the whiteboard and put your name, because that is our work as well. What is the will of God? The spiritual food of life, going out and making disciples, and then going further to accomplish his work. Whatever the Lord has for me to do in this life, my job is to do it, to trust and obey that the will of God is going to sustain me no matter what I go through in life. I have not come here to do my will, Jesus says, but the will of him who sent me. What should Jeff Brown say? I have not come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38, that's what it says. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So our prayer every day should be something to that effect. Lord, what is your will for me today? Give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear. And here's the thing, the Lord is not mysterious. He's not hiding You know, and as soon as you find his will, he moves again. You go, oh, no. What we're going to see, the problem with us is we don't 
lift up our eyes. Most of the time, we're too busy on these silly things. Or oftentimes, we're just busy with our priorities are out of whack, can we say? Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Give you an example of this. I had written this out, and then I was mowing the yard on Friday, and um, we were going out, and I wanted to get that yard done, just get it finished. You know, in the spring times, you get it mowed, and then two days later, you're like, what? I just finished this. And um, I did, and at the same time, uh, my wife and I have been praying in particular for a, a neighbor that we would uh, give the gospel to, that we could get a chance to do that, and the Lord would sort of work that out. It's fascinating when you pray that, the Lord does it. But the problem with us is we're not lifting our eyes. And so as I was mowing the yard, uh, the neighbor came up. Uh, the neighbor had just come back from work, and uh, I could tell uh, she wanted to talk, and so I was thinking, I, I just need to mow. Just, I'm mowing grass, very important. I didn't say that, but in my mind I was thinking that. I thought, I just need, I just need to do this. just need to get it done. Later, Lord, later. But certainly what hit my heart right then was this idea that, I'm not saying the Lord spoke audibly, but the conviction that, what have I been what am I going to tell the congregation on Sunday? <laughs> I've been telling them this. And so I stopped the mower and found out life has been just so difficult. This neighbor's had a really tough uh, beginning of the year and over and over again. And so I listened. And then at a certain point, I said, you know, I'm not trying to be trite here at all. And I'm so sorry for all you're going through. Has it occurred to you that maybe the Lord is trying to draw you to actually to himself? that the Lord is in some ways getting your attention to maybe for the first time you actually meet him. And, and so we talked. And um, the conversation went very well and I was able to clarify what sin is and death. And, and this person had heard the gospel uh, many times but had not come to that place and so I sowed. And um, still praying about that but I was so encouraged that I didn't drop the ball once again, but only because of God's grace, because I would have never been convicted. I mean, trust me, I was mowing. It was mowing. But let me tell you what, that's the problem with us. Too often times we get our priorities out of whack. There's nothing wrong with mowing. There's nothing wrong with cleaning or nothing wrong with doing the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're missing the point. What are we here for? Make disciples. Win souls, be a witness. That's top shelf priority, but where does it go quickly? Way down here. And so Jesus is being very clear to him. He goes, lift up your eyes. He says, don't say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. That is the last sowing and the earliest harvest in Israel. There's a four month time frame. And maybe that was a popular saying, we don't really know, but the meaning could be something like this. Don't expect a harvest as soon as you plant. There's yet four months. And then Jesus says this, look, behold, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And so uh, to, to kind of flesh it out, it seems to be that he's saying, you say there's four months and yet look what just happened. I just talked to that woman perhaps 30 minutes ago and look what's going on and these people are streaming towards us. See, the harvest came early today. An interesting thing about sowing and reaping, and once again, sowing is talking to people about the gospel. Reaping would be the time that the Lord sovereignly saves them. And it happens in your presence and you're blown away. And it seems to happen in many other countries. America is a bit... <sighs> Well, not a bit. Uh, hard soil, perhaps, these days. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It does not matter if you're sowing or reaping. We have such a brief time to be a witness for Christ. Why don't we do it? Can I just be very blunt? I don't think we lift up our eyes. I think our eyes are always here, and even our own families, and there's nothing wrong with taking care of them, but... We're missing 
we're missing the top shelf priority. It's interesting because Jesus says the fields are white for harvest. You know, we don't know exactly what he means by that because in ancient Israel, there's no harvest that looked white. So it's not like he's pointing and they would go, oh, it's white. Okay, it's time to, time to bring it all in. No, uh, you might say, what about cotton? Y'all are some good Texans, you know that. Well, cotton grew in Egypt, not so much in Israel. So what is Christ referring to? I think he's, remember, he's using a lot of spiritual language here. I think he's actually referring to the Samaritans, who the common dress at the time, you'll never guess, white. Dressed in long, white, flowing garments, and they're coming towards him. And so you can imagine Jesus saying, look, fields are white for harvest. And they see these Samaritans coming towards him. Verse 36 through 38. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So when he says, Already the one reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life is really a picture of what's spoken about in Amos chapter 9, verse 13. The Amos, uh, the prophet says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. Jesus is saying, at this particular time in my ministry, look what's going on. Like, Sowing and reaping are occurring simultaneously. It doesn't typically happen that way. I know it doesn't happen that way for me. But there's times where the Lord does this in perhaps the first great awakening and the second great awakening and the uh, great awakening of the 1850s right before the Civil War. Happened in the North in the prayer men's uh, lay revival. It happened in the South in uh, many of the Confederate uh, camps The Lord seemed to fall down in in the spirit and save many. And yet we can't predict that. And so what does he say? Sower and reaper rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and other reaps. It's happening at the same time. So the reaper is not better than the sower. That means God's timing for the salvation of the people we talk to is not up to us. I think some churches or perhaps ministries try to do that. Turn the lights down low, get the music playing, every eye closed, raise your hand, there's one, there's another, okay? That, that sort of um, accoutrements wasn't really done ever until the 1800s in the Second Great Awakening where you had some other things going on. Now, just to be clear, I'm not discounting all that stuff. I'm just saying is this, at the end of the day, our job is to be uh, bold and clear and lovingly give the gospel and leave the results with the Lord. Um, Adoniram Judson is a good example of that. He was one of America's first great missionaries. He went to Burma. What's fascinating is, if you know a little bit about uh, missions history, William Carey told him, don't go. (laughs) William Carey said, basically, join me in India. I sent my son, Felix Carey, up in Burma, and nothing's happening. Now, what's interesting about that is is he himself, when he went to India, uh, won many to Christ, but it didn't happen for years. And so he's telling Adoniram, don't go. And Adoniram goes anyway. He goes to Burma. He sowed for six years. I don't know about you, but if I'm witnessing to people, maybe after... I don't know, six months, I'd be like, this isn't the Lord's will. Six years. Hey, Adoniram, I'm gonna come by and take a look at your church. Come on in. It's just the wife and I, a couple of kids. He was sowing for six years. End of his life, there were 63 churches in Burma and 7,000 converts. The reaping, when did it come? Not to the end. Reaping may never come, but his life was one of sowing. I, me personally, I think the Lord perhaps has called me to sow more than to reap. Probably it's actually true of most believers here. Um, 
except for when you go overseas and see some tremendous, miraculous things. And Lord, we pray that he should bring him here. Although I did hear something the other day was encouraging. Uh, I used to teach uh, high school several years ago, and one of the guys in our class that I taught 21 years ago, he was an excellent theologian and an unbeliever. I did say that. And you can know the facts of Christ. You can understand the doctrines. But yeah, I mean, he, he was an unbeliever, but he wouldn't. I thought he was an unbeliever. We'll put it that way. He was wild as a March hare. And he had written on Facebook the other day, for the first time in his life, he has come to believe. 21 years later, and many people, including his parents and others, have sowed into his life. And you can't predict these things. So he says, Jesus says, I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Who's he talking about? Well, he perhaps is talking about the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Amos, uh, all these prophets that God sent and told the people to come to him and, and turn from their sin. And, and also John the Baptist, who's now at this point is dying in prison. He's sowing his whole life. And look, the, reap, the reaping has come upon Jesus here and the apostles that are in the area of Sychar. He says, others have labored and you have entered into their labor. The way it works is that others have labored to bring the gospel to you yourself, right? Someone told you the gospel or your friend or your parents or your grandparents about Christ, they eventually got it to you. So the question is, is will you not do the same for someone else? I mean, realizing this is one of the, D. James Kennedy would say 100 years ago, it seems, we are poor beggars telling other beggars where to find food. And he says, you have entered into their labor. Let me, let me clarify, may I? Sowing and reaping a little bit more. We're all, we don't get to pick and choose what our role is. Well, all of us are supposed to be sowing. And sometimes in God's miraculous grace, we can actually experience reaping as well where the person becomes a believer. So for the sower, when you are giving the gospel to your kids, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your enemies, you sow anticipating what is to come. That God is actually going to, strangely enough, he's going to use my witness. He's going to use my witness to enact mercy. And at a particular time in age, this person will become a believer. Or he's going to use my witness to enact justice at the judgment. That God would say, I sent this person over to you to talk to you about Jesus Christ, and you didn't believe. And so, depart from me, I never knew you. That's what a sower does. He doesn't get to choose and pick who is a believer, who's not. His job is just to accurately uh, boldly, clearly, lovingly give the gospel and leave the results in the Lord's hands. What is a reaper? A reaper is the person that, that God has allowed at that particular time to, a person believes. A reaper never forgets, though, that the harvest he is experiencing is due to another's sowing. It's due to somebody else in the past uh, or, or perhaps God just opening his heart to believe. It's always a result of of someone else. I like the way 1 Corinthians 3 describes it where Paul is dealing with the Corinthians and they're saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ and all this division. And he's basically saying, hey, we are all one in Christ here. And he'll say this, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 8, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. So this is a team effort. And if the Lord has called us to doing mostly sowing, which he has with me, he could flip that on a dime and we may be reaping. We don't know. Continuing on, verse 39 through 42, what we're gonna see is Christ will reward those who actually go out to bring others to him. Maybe they go out on the other side of the world or maybe they just go across the street. It doesn't matter, but they go. 
Verse 39 and 40, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. So they believed because of the woman's testimony. We are supposed to go out and be witnesses of Christ and this is what this woman does. You know, it's interesting. I would have picked Nick. I mean, Nicodemus. I would have gone with Nicodemus. But Nicodemus... He's, he's scared, and we don't know exactly when he believed or even if he believed, but we think he did because he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, took Jesus' body down from the cross and buried him. But Nicodemus is, for fear of the Jews, he's, he's going to be quiet. This woman, she goes out. Notice God blesses her. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, for, and he stayed for two days. Let me tell you all something. Samaritans do not invite Jews to stay. They kick them out of their city, but he stays for two days. They are so certain that he is the Messiah. And what has happened here? They believed. And you're gonna see this over and over in John. The Jews, his own, did not receive him, but others do receive them. Is it because the Samaritans are better than the Jews? No, we are all dead apart from God's grace But the Lord is basically turning this over on his head, and we'll see God's mercy continuing on throughout the book. Finally, verse 41 through 42, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. That phrase, Savior of the world, the Jews don't use the term Savior to refer to the Messiah. And you would go, huh? What? Why not? Well, Savior, they would say, that's only for God alone. (laughs) But Jesus Christ is God. So, uh, well, what also is noted is this. The Greeks and the Romans actually called their gods and their emperors the Savior of the world. But now, by God's grace, they're going to say, we're wrong. This one is the Savior of the world. So you see, Christianity, when I say of the world, Christianity does not teach universalism, that all will come to faith, that all will believe, that others, even if they don't hold to Christianity, they will believe. No, no, no. All people without distinction, not all people without exception, that the Lord will save even Gentiles and not just Jews. So to give you all some applications of this, Um, I'd like to conclude with some questions and some other things. Questions on winning souls or being a witness because it's really in essence the same thing. Question number one, am I as committed to the Lord's work as he is? Well, you'd say no, of course not. But maybe that's something we could aim for. You know, there were people that would sing as they go out into the battle. It was the Spartans. That's why 300 Spartans could hold off, oh, the Persian army, 300. They would sing. Pagans would sing as they go off to battle. Christians, where are we in this? Will we shoot for that? Can we pray that the Lord would do that in our lives? Another question, number two, am I willing to forego a meal, discomfort, or reputation for me to follow the Lord's will? In my case, am I willing to stop mowing the grass for a few moments? Luke 9 says, if anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. It's supposed to be painful. Some of y'all imbibe some sort of Walt Disney gospel that doesn't require any sort of pain and suffering. It's not the Bible. Number three, what are some of my self-made hindrances that keep me from carrying out the Lord's will? They're self-made. I I did it to me. Um, I mean, consider this, the foolishness, really, foolishness of chasing your life goals of education, career, marriage, family, retirement, and yet failing to carry out God's will of making disciples. Consider the heartache one day to look back on your life and realize that you have climbed the ladder of success only to realize it is leaning against the wrong building. 
We're not talking about your salvation here. Just talking about God has you here to go make disciples. That's, that's top priority. Let me give you some advice on winning souls or being a witness. And this isn't all the advice. The Bible's chock full of things, but I'll just give you three. Number one, pay no attention to the quote unquote success rate. I beg of you not to do that. That's not how God judges. Like if you witnessed to 10 people today and none of them come to Christ, you go, I'm never doing this again. It's not a strikeout, not at all. Our job is to boldly, clearly, lovingly explain the gospel and leave the results with the Lord. Can I give you the gospel? I think I will. Bad news is this. You're a sinner. You were made to glorify God according to Romans 3.23 and you fell way short of it. Uh, it. Sin is anything you think, say, or do displeasing to God. Uh, the bad news gets worse. The wages of sin is death. You're gonna die, not just physically, but you will die eternally in hell because of your sin. There's your payment. And by the way, when I, do, when I go through this with people, I beg of you not to give them the good news until you've given them the bad news because all Americans think they're going to heaven. Many do. And so many times I will go through some of the commandments just to point out lying, stealing, adultery of the heart, that they really are sinners. I'm not gonna leave them there, though. <laughs> you can't leave them there. Then you gotta give them the good news. God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5.8. That's good news. But then it can't stop there either. It's, you have to go to the final good news, and that is Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. Oh, you know it. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. I most times conclude with the resurrection because I see Paul doing that in Acts, that one of these days Christ will rip the sky open and he will come down, he will make all things new and he will judge the living and the dead. And you better pray that you're of the living. That means you've come to the place of trusting Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. I oftentimes will say, if I were to die today and stand before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? I'm not saying he would, but if he did, I would say you shouldn't. I'm a lying thieving, murderer of the heart. I've broken all the commandments. But the man, God man, sitting next to you, Jesus Christ, died for me. He gave me his righteousness. I gave him my sin. That's the gospel. And some of you go, I can't write that fast. You know the gospel. And if you don't, my encouragement is even get online. There's some really great, uh, uh, Ray Comfort has got some good things with living water and find out how he witnesses. But you know it. Bad news, sin, death. Good news, Christ came to die, rose from the dead, and also you need to come to a place of trusting him alone for your salvation. So, um, question is this, am I a Jeremiah who witnesses his entire life and wins virtually no souls, or am I a Peter who witnesses on one day, the day of Pentecost, and wins 3,000 people? Who was more faithful? Both. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16 says it like this. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, an odor from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. So the question is this. Today, will I be an odor or a fragrance? It doesn't matter. God is going to use my witness to win or to condemn. Maybe the question to ask ourselves are this. Is there any smell coming off me at all? <laughs> you see, be careful. Christ one day welcomes us not on our successes, but on his success. So he does not say, well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. So my point is pay no attention to that success rate. You be bold, clear, and loving in the gospel and leave the results for the Lord. Number two, pray as you obey. Pray as you obey. Luke 10, 2 says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So even as you go, and we ought to be doing this here at Grace, we ought to be saying, Lord, would you help us to be a light to these people around us? So many people are moving in here, folks. What are we doing? Are we going out to them or are we waiting for them to come to us? 
And number three, that's the last thing, is get to work in the field the Lord has sovereignly put you. He sovereignly puts you where you are at a particular job or school or um, neighborhood, and you don't need to go, well, one of these days I'm going to witness. Mike Talley, I'm going to go to that next mission trip. Let me write that down so I can witness then. No. I mean, yes, witness. But also, the Lord has sovereignly put you where he put you, so don't wait you don't know what tomorrow holds. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Another story, um, Dr. Johnson, S. Lewis Johnson tells about a guy named Hudson Taylor, famous missionary to China, you know him. He was the most famous missionary to China in modern times, and when he was at Ningpo in China, he led a young Buddhist leader named Ni to Christ. After hearing the message, which was on John 3, 14 and 15, this man rose and said, I've long sought the truth as did my father before me, but without finding it. I've traveled far and near. I've searched it in Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, yet I found no rest. But I find rest in what we have heard tonight. Henceforward, I am a believer in Jesus. Ni became a leader in spiritual things in that city. Later, he was talking with Hudson Taylor, and he raised a question not easily forgotten. He asked, how long have you had the glad tidings in England? Taylor, very ashamed, said vaguely, it was actually several hundreds of years. What? exclaimed Mr. Ni in astonishment. Several hundred years? Is it possible that you have known about Jesus so long, and only now you have come to tell me? My father sought the truth for more than 20 years and died without finding it. Oh, why did you not come sooner? I would be remiss if somehow you leave here thinking this is all on your backs. Let me tell you what. You cannot do this. You can't. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So breathe. You are not welcomed into the kingdom based upon your last performance. This is the Lord's work. He works through you. So my point I'm trying to get to is just let him do it. I'm telling you to trust. I'm telling you to obey. Daniel Towner was an evangelical. He was in an evangelical meeting in Brockton, Massachusetts in the 1880s. As a young man, he rose and he gave a request. He concluded he's not certain of what he's going to do, but he says, I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. Uh, my favorite verse of that song, Trust and Obey, actually has come partly from Joshua 1.16, where they're talking about is where he sends me, I will go. What he says to me, I will do. And that verse goes like this. And maybe you can help me in a moment. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says, we will do. Where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. So we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So, Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we are so falling short of this. Uh, I'm certain. And yet, when we consider the forces of darkness try to stop us at all times and all ways, it's understood. And yet, Father, we pray that you would just grant us grace, lots of it. Would you change our hearts in the sense would you give us both to will and to work for your good pleasure, as it says in Philippians? Lord, help Grace Church of Ovilla that we would be a light, that we would set that light out, and we would bring, by your grace alone, many into the kingdom, by the work of your Holy Spirit. In your son's name we pray it. Amen.